Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time. We're grateful to have you here. Pastor Rutland mentioned last week we're going to be meeting and praying over the best way to transition back into the building. And so I know some of you have been sharing you'd like to stay outside all winter uh, with heaters, but I, I promise you that it will not work well. So most likely sometime in October we'll be heading back indoors. But what a blessing this morning, this weather is beautiful. So I want to pray for some of the churches in California and different parts of the country that have been under some persecution and lots of attack and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let's go before our God and ask his blessing on them. Father, we thank you for the privilege this morning to worship the living God. Father, I thank you for these brothers and sisters who are seeking to worship in the uh, regulations that are calling for some of them next to impossible to gather as the people of God. And so we pray that you would be with these dear leaders and churches, God, that you guard them and watch over them and that the persecution that will come upon them will be used for your name's sake. And so I pray that you strengthen them and encourage them in grace. God, we pray as a country, Lord, that we continue to put Jesus Christ in all the churches, Lord, that He would be lifted up and worshipped and praised and that He would be our hope in this better country where, is where we would all fix our hope. So God, we thank You for Your providences and how You're working in 2020. I give You thanks that you're making hearts be ripped out and start to wonder and look for hope in a hopeless world. Oh God, may we be faithful to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to hopeless hearts. God, let us enter in and redeem this time. Use us for your name's sake. I pray this morning as we open up the Word of God, Lord, let it be an all-you-can-eat buffet. Let the saints of God treasure the words that we're going to look at this morning. I pray do mighty things through the Word of God, by your Spirit. Amen. We start a new chapter this morning in our study through Romans. God really met us in a beautiful way in Romans chapter 4. Some merciful transformation in my own heart and life, and I pray uh, for yours as well. This feels somewhat like when I teach the attributes of God and every week I come and tell you it's my favorite attribute. Chapter 3 felt like my favorite chapter in Romans and I think chapter 4 eclipsed it. And just my early studies in chapter 5, I think chapter 5 is my favorite chapter in Romans and I do know chapter 8 is fast approaching. So we will see where God takes us. Let me introduce to you not only this chapter, but we're actually starting a new section in Romans, the, this section is chapters 5 through 8. Romans 1 through 4 is that God has kept his promise all the way back in the garden and that he made to Abraham to bless both Jew and Gentile, that those who would have the faith of Abraham would be justified before God through faith alone in Christ alone for the foundation of our eternal inheritance. And we have seen that in those four chapters. Now in verses 5-8, through eight, we're going to begin looking at what I'm going to call the fruit then of justification. The fruit of being made right with God. It, it does something. It's not just judicial and positional like we have seen with our standing before God in a courtroom, but this salvation is very practical and powerful as well. And so it secures the blessings of the gospel that we have looked at. And how does this express itself then in our living now, day-to-day life? This is what Paul, we saw at the beginning of Romans and the end of Romans, he called the obedience of faith. I'm writing to bring about the obedience of faith. And so we have been looking at what our faith is in, and now we will see that this faith brings about obedience. And as you look at this section, I'm going to call it a, a sandwich section. I know I'm stuck on bread, but just two slices of bread, chapter 5 and chapter 8. And if you'll look as we begin in Romans 5, 1 through 2, Paul says we exult in the hope of glory. We exult in the day of being glorified and brought into the new heavens and the new earth. 
And then he closes it out in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And, and God will bring us to glory. And so this is going to be a, a foundation stone in the Christian life that there is power from God to our lives to bring transformation, to, to empower us and change us into the image of Christ. And I want you to hear this. Our certain hope by faith in the promise made to Abraham through his seed last week in verses 23 through 25 of chapter 4 that he was delivered up for our transgressions and he was raised for our justification. In our present day-to-day -day lives, that truth should produce an exulting and a rejoicing in God and our hope of glory to be spent with Him forever. And so there is a power to the hope that we've been studying and looking at. It, it better be sure and it better be certain or I will waver in unbelief all of my days based upon circumstances. Like many around us, and sadly enough, in some of our own hearts, a wavering if we're not anchored on these promises and that's where we're moving and that's our hope. So we're going to dig into this section that's bracketed by our hope of glory that as we live in this present age that has sin in our own hearts and outside, there are going to be tribulations and there will be suffering. Fears within and fears without. We can live outside the dominion of sin that we saw in Romans 3.9. We're all under the dominion of sin and there's a power that can bring us out from under that to where we can live lives that will be pleasing to our God. We can live in this present world with the love of Christ and the hope of glory, with our salvation secure that we stand in grace, filled with His Spirit, manifesting God to this world by the way we live our lives corporately and individually. Do you see a lot of this in our world? The need for a revival. We need to understand Romans. This is where we want to get. How do you, how do you get there? How you get to this place of godly living is the only way to have freedom. To, to love God and to love others and not be in bondage and fear and lack of assurance all of your days. God's designed something bigger than insecure waverers who stay children in their faith all of their days. God's designed something better for the children of God. And so I want to be a minister for your joy in this section. I want true, real spirit wrought joy to fill every heart in this church because that is the power of living a Christ-like life in this world so that every lost, no joy, happiness based on your circumstance person would cry out, what is the hope within you? And so I'm praying now we are transitioning and we don't leave behind one through four. We live in light of it and this hope and the security that we have will transform us and let us be bright lights in a dark and dying world. And so let's go to our God and pray. Every one of us would shine like this for the glory of God and they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. So let's go to our God. Father, we desire to live into these promises. God, I pray for no unbelief. I pray that we would all be full of faith, even a mustard seed. And we would look at this gospel that we've been studying and we would see it's all of you. And it's finished and it's done. And the one who believes enters into this promise of eternal inheritance that come to all the saints who hope in Christ. And so God, your grace will bring us home safe. And I pray that that would do something in hearts. God, that it wouldn't leave cold, apathetic, lukewarm people, but those vibrant, alive, dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Those wanting to know their God and make Him known and be conformed into His image, God. The motivation that should come from this gospel is mighty and powerful. And God, too many are stopping short in unbelief. And so I pray 
for full belief, the gift of faith for every soul here, and a strengthening and a deepening of our faith in these days that we will live different than a dark and dying world. God, put us on display for your glory and your name's sake alone, we pray. Amen. Romans 5, 1 through 11, I'm going to call this the exalting section in our outline. We'll look at three parts. Verses 1 through 2, we're going to exalt in the peace and grace of God. And then next week, we're going to see that in the same way we exalt in our tribulations. <laughs> Only Christians will ever be able to understand that connection. And then we're going to look at the last section that we exalt in being reconciled to our God. That is the fruit of justification. The people of God are exalting people. The rejoicing, worshiping people. And so let's take this diamond and look at it from all sides in the next few weeks. And I want you to join me and come let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. This morning, verses uh, 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, therefore, you know that's pastor's favorite word. And I came across a quote this week that I just feel like I need to share with you from the doctor, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, the secret to the Christian life is knowing how to use the word therefore. Amen? <laughs> if you don't understand therefore, you'll never get the Christian life. And so now you've got to get this therefore. Therefore is, what is it? Therefore. And it's therefore having been justified. This word is completed action. It's past. It's done. It's a declaration, not an exhortation. It's therefore what we've been studying for a year Having been justified, declared not guilty, accepted before your God, it's done. It's finished by faith. You're not working at it. You're not trying to get it. You're not hoping one day it will come. Therefore, right now, having been justified by faith. That is what God wants. He wants you to have a strong confidence and assurance of this gospel. I heard a preacher say, strong faith is pride. Doubts and fears, he said, are humility. Charles Spurgeon said they look at these thorns as though they were flowers. They're thorns. It's unbelief. God doesn't want you to have fears and struggle all your days with doubts. He wants you to have strong, firm assurance in Him and His promises and to live a life into that, the fullness that will come out of it. And so I want you to look with me this morning at verses 1 through 2. Our outline is simple, but profound and full of truth. <clears throat> Paul will show us three realities of our justification, and we're going to call these the fruits of being right with God. The first one we'll see is a relational reality between us and God. Then there's an experiential reality that we will look at, that we stand in grace. And then there's a perspective reality that we must have, and that's going to be our hope of glory. So let's look at those three this morning. In verse 1, the, rea the relational reality, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. I want to dig in. This could be one of my favorite statements in the Bible. We have peace with God. And I just want to begin. It's in the present tense. We have ongoing, continuous peace with our God. It can't be broken. It's just continual. It's not going to ever be broken. And so I want you to notice that the peace of God, which is the peace of living into the promises and who He is, that can be broken daily. Doubts, fears, assaults, unbelief. But the peace with God that you have through our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be broken. And so what that means this morning the war is over. We are exulting full of joy because the war with God is over. It's ceased. The tensions and hostilities and all of the enmities, they're done. There's peace with God. What war? What war, Pastor? I've never started a war with God. You might be sitting here this morning and just saying, I'm okay with God, I don't have a problem with Him. That's why I came to your church this morning. I'm just neutral. I'm fine with Christians if you love them and 
sing about them and talk about them all the time. I could put up with you guys. Romans 1, it says we put them out of our mind. We suppressed them. I'm not at war with God. I don't even think about them. He's out of my thoughts, my heart. What do you mean a war? I'm all right with God. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God has enmity toward men. That was Romans 1 through 3. The truth of creation, as you look out, is telling you there's a God and you're suppressing it, saying, I don't want to deal with a God. He gave you his law, and those in the church are suppressing God by trying to keep rules to, to keep God away. To, to try to make you feel like you're all right. The reality is that since the fall, we all are at enmity with God. The true God is pressed upon your heart and you hate Him. And you seek to get rid of Him and get Him out of your mind. Multitudes will, gra- will gather this Sunday morning to worship a God who they're at enmity with. They'll sing songs to a God that they hate in their own heart. He's a God that they've created in their own minds and their own hearts, one that fits with their life and how they think. And they're at enmity with the true God. Some of you might be sitting here this morning at enmity with God with your little cross on. Romans 5.10 says, while we were yet enemies with God. Romans 8.7 says, while we were hostile to God, we couldn't submit to His law. And Romans 1.30 says we were haters of God. There's been a war with the Creator and the creature since Genesis 3 and the fall in the garden. All are born into this world at war with their Maker. And there's enmity in both hearts. There's enmity in God's heart toward our sin. And there's enmity in our own hearts toward God. And it's deeper enmity than any Jew or Gentile ever had. It's deeper than any Jew or Arab. It's deeper than the North or South and the Civil War. I was in Ireland. It's deeper than the Catholic and the Protestants. There's a deeper enmity between God and man than any enmity in the history of the world. And I just want to ask you then a simple question. Does that scare you at all to see the insanity of being at war with your Creator? Little created ones sitting here this morning, you're at war with the Creator who speaks universes into being and that withholds more of His power than reveals it and you're sitting here this morning at enmity with that? Most wars, you enter in because why? You think you might win. A valiant battle and we might get freedom. Might be released from our enemies. But this one, if you die in this war, you will lose for all of eternity. The wrath of God will be on you for all of eternity if you lose this war. That's the insanity of humanity is that you could be at war with a creator and put your head on your pillow and fall asleep at night. This is a war you can't win and it's a war that you can't die in. How do I know I'm at war? What you feel in your heart when you hear the Gospel. When you hear that there's nothing you can do and God did it all in the humility of putting His own Son on a cross. What does that do to your heart? What you think when you're told to live God's way versus your own thoughts about your morality and how you want to live. Maybe the fact you can never find peace. Your conscience is accusing you. Quiet. Whenever it's quiet, I can never attain the desire in my heart for shalom. And I know that I'm not at peace. And I know I'm not at peace because I'm trying to self-justify by going to church and cleaning up and I'm always trying to to get myself right and feel good about who I am because I know I'm at war. You can't find rest and you can't find peace. And so I want you to hear this clearly. 
If you're at war with God, you will lose. And you're going to lose badly. And that's why I guess I do what I do for a living. I don't want you to die at enmity with God and at war with Him. When the white flag has been sent in Jesus Christ. You must know how deep this enmity was. That all of your working under the law cannot remove it. It just increases it. Being a good person trying to get God just increases the war. Paul said it brought loss. It didn't get me closer to God. It got me further away and made the enmity worse. There's nothing you can do to take the enmity out of your heart toward God and the enmity out of God's heart toward you. The whole Romans has been saying there's nothing you can do to fix that. Romans 3.21 But now, the God of the universe has entered the world to bring about peace with Him. For having been justified by faith, God's made a way for the war to be over. He made a way that you could get right with your Creator. And you could have peace and not be at war with God. All of our labors through Romans 1 through 3, all the enmity, all the sin, all the corruption in our heart, here it is. I want you to hear it. You, person in Romans 1 through 3, can have peace with God. That's the best news I could ever give to you. Can you think of anything better? There's a way to have peace with your Creator. Well, how? How do I get that? Well, most peace treaties, what do you do? You, you meet in the middle. I'll give you some and you give in some. <clears throat> I'll quit blowing up buses and cars if you'll quit doing this or that. And we'll have a peace treaty. And this, this peace treaty that I'm offering this morning has nothing that you're to do. It's an amazing peace treaty. You're at enmity with God and God enters the world and He does it all to bring about peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has come and He got up on a cross and He propitiated, He, he drained the wrath of God against our sin. He, he took the sword of justice and bore it in our place. All of God's enmity toward you for your sin was poured out on His Son on Calvary's tree. Isaiah says, God says, now there's no fury in me. There's no more enmity in my heart toward you because my son drained every last bit of it. They're the only way to get the enmity out of God's heart is wrath has to be poured out on sin. And his son was put on that cross and he drained every last drop of the cup of God's wrath. And God raised his sword against his son so that now he can lay down his arms against us. God made war against His Son on Calvary so He could put the banner over us of peace. And now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and most peace treaties, there's still a little bit of enmity and one little thing starts the war up again, doesn't it? But in this one, there's no more enmity at all in the heart of God. Now there's peace. Amen? Amen? You should be jumping up exulting. <laughs> I miss R.C. Sproul, and I love R.C. Sproul, and he shares a real vivid illustration about this. He said when he was a little kid, they were out playing baseball in the street, and it was his turn to bat, and he's in the old batter's box. And right while he's standing in the box, he said all the moms came running out. And they came running out, and they're hugging and they're screaming and rejoicing and they're beating pans with spoons and weeping and laughing together. And my mom said, he's coming home. Your, your father is coming home. The war is over. <laughs> what joy, he said, filled the streets over peace. The war is over. World War, World war II is done. It's finished. And this morning he's saying, God is saying, we have peace with God. There's a peace treaty signed in the blood of Jesus Christ that's proclaiming the war is over between God and humanity who will come to faith in Christ. The war is done. There's no more battle. 
And I pray that you would hear from the heart of God. The war is over. He offers you peace with himself this morning. <clears throat> by faith in Jesus Christ, having been justified by faith in him. Isaiah 54.10, For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my hessedness, my loving kindness, will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. My covenant of peace <coughs> will never be broken. It's eternal. And one other thing I want you to consider for your exalting this morning is in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. How? Not counting their trespasses against them. And He's committed to us the word of reconciliation this morning. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's as if God's begging through me this morning, will you be reconciled to God and not live in enmity and war with Him? He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And what I love here is, is there's this enmity <coughs> because of our sin. And God says, let us go to man. God yields first in our enmity because we never would have. And I want you to admire His mercy that He begins the reconciliation because we just would have never done it. We would have died in our enmity. And God enters the world first to solve this and bring us to Himself. Picture the chasm that He stooped. The innocent party is the one who went out to the defiled. We began the quarrel and He made reconciliation. And so I pray that you would exalt in a God who would do such a thing for us this morning. And this isn't a fable or a fairy tale. You should be exalting. The God of the universe entered this world to, to bring reconciliation between God and mankind. Just some quick application because I, I don't want to wait to the end. Jonathan Edwards, he said this peace is twofold. He said it's real. It's the objective state of the soul. It's, it's a statement of fact and truth that you have peace with God this morning through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then secondly, he said it's a sensible peace. And he says this is our, our sense or our experience of peace. Can you have objective peace with God and not experience the sensible peace? And Edward says, yes, but that's not God's ideal. It's why he writes books like Romans is so that there's this objective peace with God and there's a sensible peace that we know we're at peace with God. And we'll see next week that the Spirit of God sheds abroad in our heart the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so the biggest question I need you to answer for your own heart is do I have peace with God Right now, this morning, not after 10 years of working and cleaning up and being a better Christian. I want you to answer that right now. Do you have peace with God this very second as you sit here before Him? And it's objective. And that's all that we've been studying in Romans of how God has brought this peace about. But in Romans 5.5, 5, it speaks to the sensible aspect of God's love and knowing His peace. And so what I, what I want to ask you is, what is what's blocking it? If all your days you, you've believed this gospel and you just can't find this peace. And I want you to, to think through this. This is just whether you're just a theologian this morning and, and very academic. And that's all it's ever been for you. Or whether you grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's the difference of what I'm wrestling with here. Is the nearness of God your delight? Besides thee, there's nothing I desire on this earth. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. There's one thing I've asked of the Lord to go into the temple and behold His beauty and to meditate in His temple and His presence. 
That's peace. And when you know this peace and you get it objectively and you get it subjectively, what it means is I know that I've got peace with God and he's now my delight. I exult in him. He's my joy. He, everything about me now is I have peace with God and I live into that reality and I live out of it. And that's what we're looking for here in Romans 5. That's when you start exulting instead of being Eeyore. This will change everything in your life if you get this. And so that's what I've been praying for and asking God for for every one of us this morning. And so I want you to hear this. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a temporary truce and it's not a small ceasefire. It's an eternal peace treaty written in the blood of Christ. But justification does something amazing. And starting with both hearts now, there's, there's peace and there's reconciliation. And this is how we'll go live the Christian life. As we're no longer at enmity, we're at peace with God. And we know it doctrinally and we know it experientially. But now there's peace with our Creator. And this should overwhelm every heart sitting here this morning. So that's our relational reality. Don't you love it? Peace with God. And now secondly, I want to look at the experiential reality in verse 2, if you'll look with me. <coughs> Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Through whom also, through Christ, we've received something else. We've obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. And so I want you to see that we have access to God, not just peace. You can have peace treaties and, and not have what we're going to look at right now. And what came to my mind was 2 Samuel 13. Ammon rapes Tamar. And Absalom gets upset and he kills Ammon. And then he flees because of the wrath of his father David. And time passes with this breach and this enmity between father and son. And Joab finally goes out and tells Absalom, you can come back. And he gives him the promise from his father, there's peace. <clears throat> there's no enmity against you any longer, Absalom. You're back, but you'll have no access to the king for like a couple of years. And I want you to see that's not the peace that we have with the king. We have Mephibosheth. We're invited to the king's table to enjoy all of his fullness and all of his bounty. It's not peace, but stay away because this God's scary and you never know if something might flip it again. We're, we've got peace with God and now we enter into this relationship of standing in grace. And so I want to look at just a couple key words this morning. I want to look first at grace. When you think of grace, it's been defined as God's unmerited favor. God's favor to those who deserve the opposite. But really, grace is what lies behind God's entire plan of redemption. It, it started in eternity past, Christ in this earth, and also into eternity future forever and ever and ever. <clears throat> Paul said it was grace that saved him and sanctified him, and it's grace that will bring him to glory. It's all of God's doing, all of his grace Grace is God doing for me what I can never do for myself. That's been Romans. That's been the whole theme of what we've seen. To grow in grace, to grow in the knowledge of my, my weakness and my trust in his strength that we saw last week in Romans 4 of believing the promises. And I think that is why God leaves sin in us till glory. I think that's why he brings trials and thorns in the flesh and he puts his treasure in earthen vessels so to keep us weak and needing grace. And grace is so big then that the context has to define what aspect of grace. And Paul calls it this grace, which indicates that it's a specific grace in mind that he's talking about. And he says it's a grace in which we stand, this grace. And so as we saw in verse 1, having been justified by faith, Paul is saying we stand in this grace. We stand in the grace of being justified, of being right with our Creator and our God. And so we stand in this state of being right with God and having peace with God. 
And Dana and Manti, there's this preposition ace that says then, now you're brought into the sphere of grace, God's favor, God's power toward those who believe. And so catch this, we were previously in the sphere of God's wrath. Romans 1, 18 through 3, 20, you're under the wrath of God. You were under his hand, the law. And now he's saying there's a complete, you're in a whole new sphere now. I, the gospel can bring you into the sphere of grace because we stand before God, a justified man, woman, or child. And so understand this, the power that once stood in the service of wrath now stands in the service of grace towards you who believe. That hand that was used to pour out displeasure is now the tender hand of a father engaged for your good, working all things for your good. That hand is no longer employed against us, but rather for us. That's what this gospel can do. I hope you see that. The gospel takes that hand of wrath and now it's a hand of a father in favor. You, you stand in grace. It now works to conform us into the image of Christ and to bring us to glory. And so how do you not exult in that? This morning, we stand in grace. And grace is God's power to bring you to glory. And I want to look at the word stand. He said, so you will stand not because of you, but because grace keeps you standing. And I need to know that, and I need to trust that. The only reason you're still standing this morning is by the grace of God. By His mercy, we have been brought into this grace of justification. And that is the grace in which we have the privilege to stand. We no longer stand under the wrath of God. We stand under the grace of God as sons and daughters. And later in Romans 14.4, Paul says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand by his grace. And if you stand on the last day, it will be because of Christ who stood by you and kept you all of your days. And in Romans 4.16, we saw that, that faith and grace, certainty, connection. And so sovereign grace will get us there. And that's this whole section is your glorification is certain. Because it's God's grace and power. We're brought in the hands of the living God and all His power. And those hands are hands of love. But they're hands that will not let you fall. Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. He will not let you fall. He is ever near you. And He will not let you fall. 2 Chronicles 16.9 The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. One of my favorites, Psalm 23.6 Surely goodness and love and kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of the grace and the power of of God. One last one. Jeremiah 32 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will faithfully plant them in the land with all my heart and with all my soul. And so we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And the third thing is it's by faith. And we've spent about a chapter and a half on faith. And so this will come by the one who does not work, by the works of the law to get right with God. This will be the one who believes and the God who makes sinners right with him. And the first, fourth word I want to look at is the word access. We have obtained our introduction. Prosagoge. It means access, the right to enter, the freedom to enter, or our introduction. It, it, it literally means access. <clears throat> this word's used only two other times, all by Paul. And they're in Ephesians 2.18 and 3.12 where he's given the temple structure. It's the idea of where the veil was torn in two. And now you can come into the very presence of God through this gospel. You can enter in. 
I have access to God. And so we, we have this freedom now. So the grace, that's the grace in which I stand. It's not just peace, but his presence. And this should amaze the Christian the rest of your days. I, I get God. I get his favor. I get access. I, I just, you have communion with God. The freest thing. I, I can just dwell with him all day long. I'm one with him. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I have access to God for the grace that will conform me to the image of Christ. And so we stand in grace and we have the power of God as we're going to move on in Romans to live different lives and new lives in him. And so the relational reality is you got peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then secondly, the experiential reality is now I have access to God and favor and grace and all of, all of his fullness is mine to drink from and, and, and have. And now just a perspective reality as we close out in the second part of verse 2. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And so hope, as we've looked at, it's guaranteed and it's certain, and that's why Abraham believed God. And God gives grace to give glory. And in Revelation 21 through 22 in our community group, we just read that chapter 21. And when the new heavens and the new earth and that heavenly Jerusalem will come down and there'll be no more tears or sorrow. Glory is grace in full bloom. And we glory in the hope of glory. And we have this expectation that eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Paul said he saw things that he can't even declare. And so brothers and sisters, I want you to hear this. You have been called to glory where you will stand blameless with great joy forever. And we will see God. His glory will be fully known. And we will see our blessed Christ. And the light of His glory will shine and radiate for all of eternity. And we're going to be made like Him. And we will finally and fully image God. We'll be perfect image bearers for all of eternity. And we'll have no more wrestlings or struggles or doubts or fears, assaults, sleepless nights, sin, no disaffection, no ignorance, no dullness of spirit. In the fullest sense, we will partake of the divine nature. A culminated glory, glory upon glory upon glory forever. Standing in the presence of his glory, blazing in holiness, fully conformed to his glory, and perfectly happy forever, never to be interrupted ever again for all of eternity. We will be saved to sin no more, and there'll be no more devil, cosmos fighting against us, or flesh. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so as we close, guys, the war is over. You stand in the grace of God that will bring you to glory. And so we exult in the hope of glory. The beginning, the middle, and the end is a big table of grace. And God will bring us safely home. And so brethren, we exult in the hope of glory. Not the hope of our best life now. I want you to encourage one another in these things. And so my heart is overwhelmed with the peace treaty that I live in grace and the favor of God and it's absolutely certain that I'm going to go to glory. And those things will transform your life when they go from just doctrine to the greatest reality that has ever been known. This is real. This is what God has done. And so I want you to exult. I want you to be the happiest, most joyful people. And all the 2020 garbage that's gone on, I want you to lift your eyes and exult in this. This is so good. So I, I pray for everyone who has faith to exult in this. And I, I pray if you're still at war with God, as good as the blessings that will come upon us forever is as bad as the curses and wrath that will abide on you forever with the knowledge that some little preacher stood one day and told you that God has offered the white flag. He's offered that there's peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ for the one who will believe and quit trying to work his way into this favor. And so I pray this morning, I want your war to be over 
and to enjoy the peace of God and to believe this gospel so you have the experiential peace that comes with a reconciled God and that you quit living in works for your peace with God. You're, you're still stuck with your performance as to whether you enjoy God's peace and he wants to blow that out of the water with the word of God this morning. And so I pray that for every soul. Let's go to our God. Father, I, do, I pray for every soul that has faith in Jesus Christ that you would overwhelm them by your spirit through this truth. Lord, peace with God. Let them just get the, the first fruits of that truth. Let them exult that they could have such a standing that this war is over and now we have favor. We have the, the God of the universe as a father with the sovereign, powerful hand that is engaged for our good. God, let us live into the fullness of this and let us exult with hope because our glory is absolutely certain. Hell itself cannot stop what you have begun. And so, Lord, let that lift hearts. Let that make them strong and mighty and powerful for the kingdom of God through this power flowing through their veins and their minds and their hearts. They got peace with God and they stand in grace and they have the certain hope of glory. God, do what only you can do in the hearts of your people. And we pray that you would save any soul. God, who's still at war, don't let them walk away. Don't let them put their head on their pillow ever again until they have peace with God. God, I pray by your spirit, press that upon their hearts. Wreck their, their day today. God, let them know they can't have anything else till they have peace with God. Drive that into their hearts, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.